you wanted to be a pro wrestler. Yeah. Yeah, I trained. You go from Nacho Libre, basically, Nacho Libre. <laughs> <laughs> to Wall Street. Yeah, that is much. a huge switch, bro. Uh, it's quite yeah, so when I was a broker, I was a junior <clears throat> broker, and I was making 600 dials a day. And I mean, that's what I want to do. That's it. Dude, 600 dials a day. Yeah. I heard you say that, and I was yeah. like... People don't believe it. When I was at Northwestern Mutual, we did 30 a day, and that was all they made us do. It was spray and pray. In the out. benefit of an option contract is for, and I hate the term to say it, retail traders, but individual traders, they get first order, they get first fills. The the aspect of being able to take profits from your account as well and be able to live off of it and also be able to uh, withstand a drawdown is challenging. The thing is, is understand the outcome. So, so many people have this problem with the drawdown because they're not just not, they're not expecting it. I, I'm, I have a drawdown right now. So are you, how much do you follow in the online space, this prop firm funding company stuff that's been going on? Because I want to know your- I follow it pretty closely. Okay, I, so give me your opinion on it. Uh, I'm not a fan. Why do you say stop losses don't work? Remember. And I'm old enough to remember when the flash crash happened and I was watching my screens and if I had, and if you had stop losses in when the flash crash happened, that would have triggered and you would have been knocked out of prices after they just had rebounded as well. Like, I think Congress should trade. I don't, I'm not one that says they have an edge. Really? Really, yeah. What's up, traders? Welcome back to The Day Trading Show. My name is Austin Silver. I'm your host. Today, we are back in the studio in Miami with a very special guest. Josh Bellinger is a ex-Wall Street trader, and he has a ton of experience, a ton of amazing stories. We talk about trading on the pit. He was a runner back in the day. We talk about how he wanted to become a pro wrestler, how that didn't come to fruition, and we also discuss in detail his options trading, his opinions on markets, and we even touch on the prop firm funding company stuff that I know so many of you guys are interested in. So it's a good one. It's a little long, but you're going to love it. We appreciate you. We love you for watching and listening. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of our future episodes. Now enjoy my conversation with Josh Bellinger. Tracking your trades has never been more important, and it's also never been easier with Tradezilla. Shout out to Umar and their team for being a sponsor of today's video. We love the product. I use it in the Black Shirt Club every day in the mentor mode. I use the back testing and playbook section as well. I use it for my own trading. It helps me make improvements. It's the cute little calendar that everybody likes to see when I post my PL. If you want to start using Tradezilla, Use the link in the description. Use the discount code down below. Save 10% on either your monthly or your yearly membership. Start tracking your trades today. It's going to help you make more money. It's going to help you know where you need to make improvements. Even if it's something as small as, hey, I'm losing a lot of money on Tuesdays. Let's figure out why am I losing money on Tuesdays. Let's figure out what time of day, what instrument, what asset. All of that and more can be found in Tradezilla. So if you're not a big tracking journaling guy, just let Tradezilla automate and do it all for you. Plus, you save some money when you use the link and the discount code down below. So thanks again to Tradezilla. Let's get back to the video. Traders, welcome back to the show. I am very honored to be sitting with Josh Bellinger. Josh, it's good to have you on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. So for those of you that don't know Josh, Josh is becoming extremely well-known on social media. The viral clip that we were just talking about, we'll yep. discuss a little bit today. Um, <clears throat> he's becoming very well-known, I think, because you're perceived as this ex-Wall Street insider that has experience on the traditional floor, but now, as we were just saying, you've taken it kind of personal branding, put that some spin on that in there, and now you're pushing yourself out as like, I'm a guy at home running this from my house, basically, on my own, yep. but I have the experience of 10 years of basically working on Wall Street, That's correct? Yeah, uh, real experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So today, for the listeners, I wanna talk about a couple things. I've got some stuff about your background I wanna hear about. Mm -hmm. I definitely wanna hear about what's going on with the marketplace today versus what it was when you first started trading. We'll talk about that a little bit. But before we get into that, and we'll talk about options and your way of you know perceiving markets, we'll talk about futures, I'm sure, today. You wanted to be a pro wrestler. Yeah, yeah, I trained for years. I started when I was 15 years old. It's, a, it's odd, uh, but yeah, my uncle was training in a professional wrestler, not uh, on a big stage, but he got me started in it. That's awesome. So I started at 15 years old. My mom signed my release for it, and I started at- If he falls off the high rope and breaks his neck, it's okay. Yeah, I'm surprised she signed off for it, but at I had- At 15. Pay, yeah, at 15. Um, my mom and I weren't that close, but she was my guardian, so I needed someone to sign off for it. But 
Yeah, I started training. It was in uh, Chicago at uh, PCW. That's awesome. And uh, that's, that was what my first dream was. That's what I wanted to do. And I did that for a couple of years. Um, in the meantime, I was delivering pizza to support myself and also train at the same time. But, what would your wrestler name have been? So my wrestling name at that time, I wore a mask because I still look like a baby. Face. I'm glad that you have this. See, like, and I didn't prep him on this, everybody. He, <laughs> I, I, I still have a baby face, but I was a younger at that time and skinny. So uh, my, I was a Lucha Libre, but my wrestling name was El Blanco Raton, Raton the white rat. <laughs> Even though it's not proper Spanish, but so I wore a mask, and obviously you could tell I'm not Hispanic. So the so I would say uno dos, and th- I come out throwing tortillas at the crowd. Oh my god, bro! Yeah, it was a. Uh, that is so funny, and you go from Nacho Libre basically Nacho Libre. To, <laughs> to Wall Street. Yeah, that is much. a huge switch, bro. Uh, it's it's quite the switch. Yeah, I mean, I like to say I came from, I I, I came from the trailer park, and I got a, an opportunity delivering pizza. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And if it weren't for the Edwards Jones office a couple doors down, and really my boss one day saying, if I wasn't doing this, it would be cool to be a stockbroker. That's exactly what I heard you say in an interview, that that one comment from the boss at the pizza shop Mm -hmm. changed your life, basically. Yeah, That's crazy. And I think a lot of people have those moments. They have conversations with people, but some people aren't aware of it, of like, oh, I should pursue that. It's like, They'll hear what that person says, the boss or the family friend or whoever, but it doesn't make them take action. You took action and you walked into Edward Jones and you were like, hey, how do I get a job here? Yeah. Right? (laughs) Basically. Yeah. Well, he ordered pizza. He was a couple doors down. So I went in there one day and I asked him, I said, "Uh, how do I become a stockbroker? And uh, he looks at me and I'm a pimple faced kid. He's like, do you have a Series 7? I'm like, no. He's like, do you have a book of business? And Series 7 is an industry license to sell securities. Uh, Do you have a book of business, which means you have clients? I'm like, no. He's like, well, you're going to need those things. He's like, I used to work on the floor, and uh, I don't obviously now, but if I had to give you advice, that would be the best place to start. But I don't know anyone, but that's my best advice. So I cold called every place in the Mercantile Exchange, the Board of Trade, uh, the Board of Options Exchange, and finally got an opportunity. After calling all those places and interviewing different places, I finally got an opportunity to work as a runner. How old were you then? I was 19. So young. Yeah. When you work as a runner, people hear, I worked on the floor, I worked on the pit. Mm-hmm. I was just talking to somebody about how cutthroat it, it was on the floor. They were telling me that they heard a story about someone who I think their father worked on the floor and the dad passed away, had a heart attack and died on the floor and they traded over him, this guy that had just dropped for a heart attack. Was it that cutthroat? Yeah, I mean, that story probably ain't true, Okay, but it's that cutthroat, yeah. yeah. Um, you... So that's open outcry. That's what that type of trading is. And that was an edge for those people on the floor. So traders, a lot of people think floor traders at the time were traders. They were market makers. They were making a market most of the time. Yeah. So they worked for a firm or there were locals that made a market and they could, at that time, spreads were really wide. So they're uh, buying bids and selling offers. I mean, and that's how their edge was. Hand signals, screaming at each other. Right, but that's, that, that was their edge, and that's why so many of them, when they had to transition from screens to digital, they couldn't do that because right. they had to learn a new edge. Right, because the spreads spreads were yeah. reduced, and all, all that opportunity was gone. Interesting. Well, yeah, it was that cutthroat because uh, you are in front of people, and it, we're, we're talking about millions, trillions, or billions of dollars at the time. Uh, trading throughout sure. the day. So depending on what pit it is and where you are, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the most popular pit was, or the, the busiest pit was the Euro dollar pit. I wanted to ask you about that. Why? Why do you think that that was the busier than the S&P, bigger than NASDAQ? Uh, because it's the Euro and it's the European market and also the dollar. So you just have a lot of activity. Yeah. Of and everything. I mean, that was the busiest pit. I had to go in there. I get elbowed. People push me around and I, you'd have to eventually, you know, learn how to fight through it because again, you're in front of people. And if you block someone's view, you're blocking their opportunity to make money. I was one, one of the times I was starting, I was standing outside the pit of the S&P 500. And I was just, I thought I was just like out of the way, but I was in direct with a, a broker behind, behind me. You. And they were doing, they're trying to uh, throw an order. And I was blocking and this guy starts yelling at me. And I'm like, so I'm a young, young punk kid. I start yelling back at him. Well, he starts, he's like, why don't you meet me after the, uh, when the close at the turnstile? Because he wanted to fight. I didn't realize how much money I'd, I could have lost my job because of that. Yeah, I mean, you, you could have blocked millions of dollars. I mean, a, a runner is less than a janitor, but yeah, I mean, he could have gotten me fired and That's it would have been just like that. What does the floor look like? When you say I'm 
in the, like you were, like I'm trying to picture this. Is it a big, big, big room with in the center, all these people kind of running across the room and then on the outside you have people screaming and doing hand signals. Can you paint the picture for us? Yeah, so on the, I worked at the Mercantile Exchange. That's where I, my, where I was at. So there's two levels and there's essentially, it's kind of like a, almost the size of a football field. Wow. And then you have these just kind of uh, steps. Right, that's kind of what I picture, like on the outside, right? Yeah, on the yeah. outside. So like the Euro dollar was higher, it was elevated up and some were elevated down. It's mm. so like the S&P pit was a little bit elevated down the euro dollar was elevated up because there's so many people on there. So you had your own spot as well. To stand. To stand. And it's, you know, very small. Right. But that was your spot as well. And you had to, you had to fight for every, every little thing that you can for get For every there. inch, for every penny. Mm -hmm. And what made you leave the floor? When did you decide, I'm done here? Well, when I talked to Russ, uh, the Edward Jones guy, uh, at that time, I wanted to be a stockbroker. I saw a boiler room. I mean, I was going to get my Series 7. You're and I was going to, I was going to become a millionaire. Right. So that was my, I wanted to become a, a broker. And that's what I thought was, was my journey. So I used that experience to leverage that and get into a firm. Got it. Uh, I learned a lot on the floor. And I learned essentially because of my experience that I liked the other part of it. But yeah, I wanted to become a broker. So that was my you're, you're in. Mm -hmm. So you worked on the floor to mm -hmm. give yourself some experience, to give yourself some leverage, to really get yourself into a firm. Right. And I was, interesting enough, I didn't know anything about the marketplace. Yeah. But I had a perception. I could see that it was changing. Sure. And one of the things is I, you would talk to other runners, and you're like, well, how long have you been? Because the progression is you go from a runner to a clerk, a clerk is like an assistant, and then essentially to a trader, if sure. you get the opportunity sure. to trade capital for a firm. And or, that's when you get the jacket. That's where you get the different color jacket. So I had a yellow jacket, which you, different jackets meant different things sure. or for different firms. Yellow was obvious that you're a runner. And um, the, uh, forgot the point of what I was going to say there. Well, I was just saying you use the leverage from the working on the floor to get yourself into the firm. Right. Yeah, right. I forget what you had mentioned about that. But yeah, it was, I had a point of that story. It's okay. Yeah. But we can go forward from there. So we use the leverage from the floor get yourself into the firm. My next question was gonna be, why go to a firm when today everybody watching this is thinking, trade from home, trade from home? Was it not common then because the internet was just booming? Oh, so the point of that. Now it comes in. Yeah, uh, so I saw on the floor when I talked to other runners was the aspect of like them, the timetables of where they were able to get to, a, to, to become right, a trader. Right. So I was noticing that the floor was getting less crowded because people were going to computers. Ah. Because of servers. So literally, physically, there are less people running orders. There's less clerks. There's less everything. Yeah, everything was going to servers, right. which was taking away open outcry. Right. So I started to see that change, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to stay down here and become a dinosaur. Of course. So you had to, to adapt. You had to pivot. Mm -hmm. So now it's moving towards data centers, which would make you think that people are trading from home or no. You're thinking, it's the firms. The firms are running the data. I need to get in with a big firm. Because my point is, like, why did you not think to go off on your own then? Why did you think the traditional route of go work for a firm. Just because think about the kids nowadays, younger than me. They're, they're like, I'll just trade from home. Right. And well, I, didn't, I didn't want to be a trader at that point. I wanted to be a broker. And the only way to be uh, a broker is to work at a firm. Right. So going, I, the only time, that, if to be a trader at that time, was to be a trader on the floor. Got it. Which you, you would be a local trader Got and trade. It. Someone may fund you. Sure. Um, or you had to get, um, to get a seat to, right. tra to trade as well. But you could be a local trader. But that edge was going away, like I said, because of uh, servers. And I'm sure it was going away quickly. Like, it was probably happening very fast. Yeah, I mean, they try to play it out as long as they possibly of could. Course. But when the spreads start getting tight, which is benefit to customers, right. then that edge just goes lower and lower and lower, and you just can't compete anymore on 100%. price. As, and that's the thing about exchanges. I mean, people, like, even now, yeah. you hear about um, payment for order flow sure. or all this other stuff. And that's, that's noise because payment order flow benefits customers. In what way? In creating a more, creating better pricing for when I put my order out there. It doesn't well, benefit sense. institutions. No, not at all. And our market is run by institutions. Right. It's different. It, it, interesting enough, more, China's market is more run by independent investors. No individual. way. Yeah. Yeah. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Versus our market. Is controlled by these big firms. Is controlled by BlackRock, JP Morgan, all of them. And that's because that's how asset management works. But China's market is a lot of individual investors. It's about 60%. Do you think that that's good for them long-term? Yeah, it is. You think so? Yep. 
So do you think we're going to see more of a shift in America, or do you think that it is going to still stay monopolized by the big banks and big corporations here? Well, our market is different because of how people have been, I don't want to say trained, but just learned. It's give your money to a professional and let them do it. Or you invest in, you put your money in a 401k or you know, whatever it is, and it's out of your out of, out of sight, out of mind. And as long as you are in the S&P 500 or you some mutual okay. fund, you know, you're going to be fine, even though that's not the, the, <laughs> what happens at the end of it no. when people are at retirement. But as long as it's out of sight, out of mind. So the, the game is to, to collect ac- asset and collect assets mm-hmm. and then you know, invest it into the marketplace. And you just have, especially in a bull market, or in, in you know, essentially what we've seen for the last 20 years, <laughs> you never see, really see a, a bear market. I mean, 20, 2022, sure, but that's, that, that was really nothing in, in retrospect. I would not even call that a bear market. Yeah, I mean, it, it sold off, but then it, boop, it came We're right back. It came right back. It came right back. Raging back. Um, so when you have that kind of aspect of the market going up, people don't get scared. So the only time people will start to take control is when they fear or when they lose. That's, that's, when, that's when we see more people get more engaged because they want to stop the pain. Sure. So before we go forward on that side of your story, I'm curious just a little bit more about your upbringing. You mentioned your mother already. Mm-hmm. What did your parents do? Did they do anything in finance? Uh, no, no, no. Because you said trailer park. Yep. So you've come from nothing to find your way through Wall Street. Being someone with aspirations to be a wrestler and then having that one conversation that kind of pivots you. What did your parents say? Did they support this idea of becoming a stockbroker? Did they support you going and working on the floor? Did they even know? Uh, my family never talked about that. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's, you think like working dollar general, that, that I mean, that's, that, that was kind of the. So what made you different? Uh, I started when I was younger, just seeing things differently. Uh, my mom and my stepdad would talk about other people having money. And my, my stepdad was a construction worker. My mom didn't work. So we lived pretty, we, very poor, um, paycheck to paycheck. And I just didn't like that. So I always saw things differently. I worked, uh, I worked different ways. I had two uh, paper routes where I would put a, um, a sled at the back of it and drive around, the, <laughs> drive around uh, Zion, that's where I grew up at, but ride around so I can deliver more papers instead of having to come back and go forward just to have them all and deliver more papers. So I always had that different. It's hard to explain. It's just, I just saw things differently. No, but I understand. And I think a lot of the listeners can understand too, because it's that entrepreneurial hustle. Yeah. You don't know where it comes from, but you're eight years old shoveling snow or delivering papers. And you just want to make money because you know, someone has told you some, something happened in life where your brain said money equals more freedom. Right. Or just opportunity as well. Opportunity. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So I just saw things differently. I just didn't like it. I, I just tried different things and uh, enjoyed the aspect of of doing that kind of stuff and not having excuses. I mean, my, growing up wise, it was, it was tough. So my mom wasn't like giving me money. So if I wanted to do something like, for instance, if I wanted to go to the pool in the summer, she wasn't going to give me money, but I could take the cans and take it to the recycling place and take that money and then go to the pool. So while my mom was hard, there was, there's ways to look at things. And that was kind of like, how I took it was like, okay, I'm not going to get anything, but if I want this, I got to figure out how to get that. I think that a lot of kids, I mean, it just depends on, of course, where you're coming from and where you're raised, but there's a lot of kids whose parents will just give them everything and not teach them to be resilient like that. And that resiliency that you learn at a young age programs you through the rest of your life. When life gives you an obstacle, you'll think, I'll find another way around. Versus if you're used to getting handouts for everything, you don't work as hard, I think. You ever see the Kool-Aid man? Like, oh yeah, Boom, that's, that's right what you gotta do. You gotta, oh, you gotta yeah, that. But a lot of people don't have that attitude. That's what I'm saying. And I think it's because they get too much too easy. You know what I mean? They don't have to work for it nowadays as much. Yeah, everyone's different. Everybody's different. Everyone's different. 100%. I mean, it's easy to dissect it. It's just that that for me, that's how I viewed it. Yeah. Uh, but everyone's different. I mean, people could be too hard on yeah. other people, and it, it could it go the other direction too. For so sure. For it's sure. hard. I mean, that's the thing about investing or pers- or finance. It's 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 personal to people. My risk tolerance is different than your risk tolerance, and your risk tolerance is different than the next person. Even t- time horizon is different. We're, you know, I'm retiring here, you're retiring there. Like those things all are very, very different. So it's very personal. Opinions about the marketplace. 100 percent. Beliefs about money. Yeah. It's all very individual. <laughs> yeah. So as we fast forward, then in your story, what I heard from another interview you did was you said being a stockbroker was not what you thought it was going to be. No. No. 
Can you tell us why? Well, I didn't make the money that I wanted. I didn't become a millionaire like Ben Affleck. I didn't. But you didn't quit right away. No, 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 I didn't quit. It was different at that time. I mean, when you watch Boiler Room, it was a different, it, that was different as well. Like the commissions that they had, it was just a different, I was coming at the tail end of it. Sure. And when I was, when I was coming on, that's, and people think ETFs are just like a new thing. ETFs have been around for a while. A long time. Yeah. It, longer than most people think. It's just in the finance, especially in finance, things are just slow. Everything is archaic. Like people think like on the floor, like, oh, they had these super fast computers. No, no, no. They had old crusty computers. Yeah. It was just, because no one wants to change and update anything because of risk sure. of it not working. Or risk something. of ruin, really. They don't, they don't want to have an AT&T. Sure. You know, update the. Oh, our bug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> update the software and if something happens. Right. Um, but. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So they keep using the older computer so they're more resistant to the change. Yeah, so when I was a broker, I was a junior <clears throat> broker, and I was making 600 dials a day. And, I mean, that's what I want to do. That's, it, Dude, 600 dials a day. Yeah. I heard you say that, and I was yeah. like... People don't believe it. When I was at Northwestern Mutual, we did 30 a day. Yeah. And that was all they made us do. It was spray and pray. 600. But it wasn't like they gave me leads that were, like, good. It was literally calling from a phone book. Right. Did, 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 no answer. Yeah. Did, 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 did. yeah. Right. So that's all I was doing. So I thought these lead cards were like actually investors, but it wasn't. It, it, random people. It was just random people. Hey, Crazy. It was like typical old school. They, never, they, have, they didn't have a process. No. Like I was, it was a small boutique firm, and I was like the first person to bring on to try to grow assets and get a, new accounts, and they didn't have any process. They, they had the 1980 approach of just calling and get people interested and right. try to pitch some stocks. No CRM. No CRM. No, no. I had a, I had a card file right. had a, on my desk, like right. a black a black one with uh, A B C D and the. <laughs> so what are you now? Twenty one, twenty two. I passed my Series Seven the second time yeah. when I was twenty one. Okay. Two months after I young. turned twenty one. I think that's relatively young. Yeah. So from the stockbroker, got the Series Seven, smiling and dialing, wheeling and dealing. What pushed you out of that role and really started to motivate you to be wanting to work on your own? Yeah. So I was. Opening accounts, okay. and I was making nothing. So I remember one deal. We did, we did a lot of different... The benefit of working at the firm I did was that it was small. It wasn't like a Goldman Sachs or anything like that. That's very prestige. But the opportunity that I got at the smaller firm was we did a lot of exotic stuff. Right. So I, I was part of IPOs. I was part of a syndicate. I was part of pipes, different, different types of investment vehicles okay. that we were able to raise money for. So I was able to learn a lot. So one deal I raised, I was able to get a customer on a cold call, and they invested $100,000. Wow. Now, the firm takes 50% of the commission off that. And then my senior brokers take their cut. And at the end of it, I'm left with like, I don't know, $1,000 to Dude, live off of. Crazy. Yeah. So at that point, I was like, okay, I'm not liking this anymore. That's crazy. So at the time, I was one of the aspects like on the Series 7 uh, that I took a lot of focus in on, on was options. Right. And from my experience on the floor, one of the ways I would talk to prospects is I would talk to them about options or my experience on the floor to be different, have a unique selling proposition. So that was a way that I was talking to clients to try to give them a different prospect. So all the time talking to clients or prospects, uh, I would talk about options. And everyone's like, oh, options are too risky. Options are too risky. Options are too or risky. Or too confusing. Too confusing, yeah. But at the time, too, too risky. This is... 20 years ago. It's completely different now. Now, real quick, is that because you think most people look at options as like they're trading a stock? They don't understand that they're trading a volatility instrument? At that time, it was just taboo. It, okay. was, just, it, it was just taboo at that time. Now, it's completely different. Right. More people are open to it. But at that time, it was just, no, options are too risky. Um, even at the firm, I could only pitch certain stocks because of risk. Hmm. And that's the aspect of why options were relatively kind of kept back is because firms didn't want to take, have an extra risk manager for the, for the trades Which there. Which makes sense. I get that from their perspective. Yeah, so it was, it's easier to be like, no, we just options are too risky. Yeah. Um, so I took a lot of focus on options, and that's what I started to kind of go and gravitate to. Um, during that time, I had my own trading account, and I was trying to trade, and I traded BlackBerry at the time, and I traded on earnings, and I thought I knew how to trade. Yep. No. No. <laughs> I lost it the next day on earnings. On specifically trading the options on BlackBerry. Yep. On options, because I thought I understood options from a, as a, I was a professional. I had a Series Seven, but that's not how you trade options. Like how people learn options from a book is not the proper way. That's like learning how the game of chess works. 
not how things move. So right. I, it's a very vanilla approach. So I thought, I, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to buy calls. I'm bullish on, on BlackBerry. I, w- I was right, but I didn't understand what implied volatility was sure. because that was not part of uh, the Series 7. So that's where I started to uh, take more focus and uh, understanding to options trading. And at the time, I was actually routing orders uh, for a customer overseas on their option orders as well. So I started to take a lot more interest and focus on that. Why did you never leave options? What kept you wanting to trade it even when you had this blow up with BlackBerry? Well, I just knew the benefits of options. Okay. I took a, I took a strong interest of it. And just hearing people say options are risky, options are risky. I knew that they weren't as risky as people were thinking. They well, can be risky. risky, right? Like, let's be honest. When we're talking about investing money, you always are at some degree of risk. Right. So to just turn away from something due to risk is kind of ignorant when you're talking about finance, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the concept of owning a stock is, you know, like, it's not risk, but it is risk. It's still risk. It's still risk. 100%. Options are flexible. And just the understanding of that, it was just a lack of it. There wasn't a lot of education, education about it. So or, you learned a lot from what we're listening to so far on the floor, on the ground, boots and like, mm-hmm. whether you were in the CME or you're at the firm or at your desk at home, you learned from real world life yeah, lessons. I, collecting, uh, as a runner, you collect tickets yeah. uh, on the floor. So I had to take it to the clearing firm and then the clearing firm up to the, um, to the office. So you have to do that in a 15 minute loop. If not, you, you'll either you get fired right. or you get dinged. So it's usually fired. Right. So you have to, because they have to be registered every 15 minutes. Are you physically running when you're doing that too? So you must've been in good shape. Well, fighting through all these dudes. Well, you have to fight through it, but like, you, I mean, like sometimes you may have to run a little bit. But like you're speed up walking. Like yeah, you're, you're I mean, you're moving. You're moving. Because you, you, you have, I'm doing different pits. I'm doing the S&P, the NASDAQ. 9.30 to 4. Yep. <sighs> early. Early. Yeah, I had to do statements. Ah, so, the, so you had to get there. Yeah, get the euro dollar opens, opens earlier. Opens before, right. Yeah, right. so I'm, I'm there early and from morning <laughs> to the close and learning. So I didn't know what ticks were. I'm, I'm just like bright eye diet. Like I didn't know any of that stuff. But then over time by losing, you learned L- losses sometimes are the, the big lessons for us. Yeah. What other big early mistakes did you make? The Blackberry one we could say is not a mistake, but an experience. Are there any other mistakes maybe to speak to the guys that are thinking about getting into options? Hey, watch out for this. Cause I did this or I didn't pay attention to this and it screwed me. Well, now you got zero DT. Options. And I wanted to talk to you about that because yeah. that's a huge 25% of the market now, isn't it? It's a, a big part of the market now. Uh, it's actually, I mean, it's, it's changing the whole market landscape. It's changing volatility landscape as well. Just Let's with, go into why, because I think that's important. Well, you, it's cheaper. You don't have to buy. Before, you had monthly expirations. Then you had weekly. Now you have day. So if you need to hedge your risk off, you just could, you can do it on a day. So that allows, and again, you know I don't trade options. So I'm, I'm asking for the guys that also don't trade options that want to understand mm-hmm. this. We see D, zero DTE. We see all these people talking about it. You're saying it creates a hedge for you. So you can, if I'm long in my thesis, I can hedge this with an option that will expire today and either give me profit or loss at the end of the day? Correct. So if I, let's, let's say I'm a portfolio, portfolio manager and I need a hedge. Okay. I don't have to go out to the monthlies now, which you had before. So you're paying for that monthly, you're paying for that time. Sure. Then it was the weekly. Weeklies came available uh, about a decade ago. Okay. And now you have, so now you have zero, which if I need a hedge, I can just do something short term. Wow. And hedge against that. Now you have a lot of retail people involved with zero DTE as well. So yeah. you get the leverage without all the extra expense. Mm. So you have that driving order flow as well. Do options traders typically like to be long biased or short biased? Is that a way to think about options trading? You know, when people are trading, a lot, a lot of people are long biased when they get involved with options. And, and there are some people that are short biased. It's just, it's a, um, it's a math equation and it's how you look at it. Okay. I, I see a lot of younger traders now that are trading zero DTE and they're trading big size. I mean, like size that <laughs> would make me uncomfortable. Um, it's just a different beast now. It really is. Uh, but they're putting size behind these trades and they're almost trading them essentially like futures contracts. That's what it seems like. Yeah. I am not too keen on it because to me, a futures contract is much cleaner. Without, options are messy. Options are they're beautiful things, but they're messy. Because of all the variables that go into making the option either at a profit or at a loss, the time decay. Time decay, the volatility. Price, the you have volatility. different things that fluctuate in. Right. Where a, f- a futures contract is, like you said, very clean. Right. Yeah. In the out. benefit of an option contract is for, and I hate the term to say it, retail traders, but individual traders, they get first order, they get first fills. So really? if I'm an institution and you're 
uh, retail, my order gets, the retail order gets filled first. Really? Now in futures contract, it's different. It's first in. I didn't know that. Yep. Do you know why they preference the retail? That's just how they have for, for order flow for the options. Cynical me thinks they do that to let retail in first so they can see what they should do after. But, I mean, there's a lot of noise on this. Okay. Um, Citadel. You don't seem too conspiratorial to me. No, I, I, there's, there's stuff I like. Uh, but there's some stuff that is just kind of like, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's, if you understood, you wouldn't be like, okay. Citadel, it makes a marketplace. They're a market maker. Yeah. And they're in there to make a market. Mm -hmm. It's not like Forex. Forex often, you have the firm trading against the individual. Sure. Citadel is, it, it's a ton of order flow from all various places. So it's just batched together. It's not like they're, you know, trying to trade against the, the retail. No, not at that point, right? Because they're taking, like you're saying, they're, what you're saying is they're taking money from people trading on Robinhood. They're taking money from people trading on TD. Yep. They're funneling it all in and they're making that market, which means they're making the bid and they're making their ask and they're keeping that spread pretty tight. Right, and then they hedge off and they take inventory and so forth, but they're doing it at a better price than the exchange. And that's what I was saying earlier. The exchanges don't like high-frequency trading because they can undercut right. them on price. Of course. The exchanges are like cartels. Mm. I mean- People don't understand when I open a brokerage account, I don't have to pay for my data. But if I become a professional, I have to pay for my data. I do. And exchanges that. continue to increase prices for quotes. They just recently did it now. So if you want to be, you know, trade, let's let's say you want tax benefits, be professional and so forth. Well, you have to go to the notify the um, your broker, and your broker is going to take you it which as a professional, and now you're going to have to pay those fees. As an individual, you open up an account, you don't have to pay data, data fees and any of that stuff. So like Robinhood, for instance, like they got a bad rap, but they provide opportunity to the marketplace and they make it really simple to execute. It's, I, I didn't care for Robinhood at first, but I see and, and understand like now, I'm like, okay, like it, they make it fun. It should be fun if you make money. But when you get into options, it can become very complicated. Like if I open up my platform, I show it to you. First thing you're going to be like, holy shit. Like, right. You're going to be like, what the, anyone I showed it to. I sat with a billionaire, showed him options. And first, first thing he's like, mm, everyone. It just doesn't matter who. It's just like you open up a platform and it's like, it's, you're scared. Like I'm going to break something right. or I'm going to lose my. Like it's a foreign language. I'm going to lose my tail if I mess up. Right. So there's a lot of pressure. And with Robinhood, at least they make it easy. Yeah. To, <laughs> almost easier too to screw easy. Up. Yeah, easier to screw up. Because didn't they get in trouble for gamifying trading? Is that what people were trying to say? Yeah, that's what the SEC. I mean, because <sighs> it's got cute little green dings yeah. and red dings. So yeah. they, let's, let's, let's make it too fun. You know, that, that's what the, the SEC is. No, no, we're not. We don't want it that fun. Not that fun. Yeah, we don't want it to be a casino. But we don't want to stop money in flow either. Yeah, I mean, they definitely don't want that. But they want the prestigious aspect of it. Of course. You get the, the Wall Street firms that want this to be like the big boys. You know, yeah. this is where. Serious, yeah. Serious people are. So, how has technology, other than through zero DTE, how has technology changed options trading over the last ten years? How has it changed? Yeah, just a tremendous amount of order flow. Now, I mean, we're seeing, I think on Friday, forty-two million contracts traded. I mean, we're seeing order flow of contracts just on a level that continues to increase, increase, increase because of the flexibility. You have more institutions using them. You have more structured products using them. Uh, structured products meaning like an ETF that sells calls and yeah. sells puts or collars it or structured products on different types of um, hedge funds you use. Sure. Well, they'll get a, a certain, uh, certain payout, like, I don't know, NVIDIA. Like, if you buy this note, NVIDIA will pay you X percents. So these are, you know, kind of big boy products. Mm -hmm. But you just see so many, so much order flow going into options just because of the flexibility. Now. Is that coming from international, not just domestic? U.S. is where the world comes to put their money. That's the, the benefit. It's of, been that way since World War II. Yep, yep. Because of the laws, just because of the capital, uh, the, the amount of liquidity. So that's, that's where the world comes. Um, yes, there's other markets out there, but if you are hedging, or and I hate to say hedging, but a lot of money comes into the U.S. market from global. If you were in China and you could buy Chinese options or American options, you're going to think about buying American options is what you're saying. Right, right. I mean, like it, for product wise or just different vehicles, a lot of these other countries are just not as sophisticated. And as you would know on, on the Forex side, a lot, of or a lot of countries don't want you to trade outside their country. They make it really hard. 
to take your take their capital and, and deploy it anywhere else, uh, unless you're a professional. That's what they want, right? They want the yeah. professional. But that's why I, when someone gets on CNBC, like some hedge fund guy or somebody, oh, I'm I'm getting along the Deutsch. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> the individual can't do that. No. They're not going to be able to. It helps nobody. It helps. Yeah. Right. And it almost when they talk about things. Well, let me ask you this: Like when you hear that on CNBC, when you see Kramer make a call, when you see as a guy who has been on Wall Street and knows how they talk and how they talk their book in a certain direction, mm -hmm. you do need to read into what they're saying, right? You can't just take what they say on the TV and on the news at face value and think that's going to come to fruition. No, I mean, it's engagement. They're also talking their book as well. And, and it's their, also their opinion as well. I mean, they're not just talking to TV, but they're also talking to their investors sure. and, and talking their book as well. So it's not always, I mean, I think we were talking about Ackman earlier. Mm -hmm. Ackman was during the COVID COVID crash. You know, he short the market and then a couple days later, oh, I bought it. Yep. Bought it back. That's exactly what I was just thinking <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah. So, I mean, it happens, but like people, it, you know, it's, you have to understand their position. You have to understand the thesis. You don't know when they got in exactly and you don't know why. Right. Like I said, the I would say follow the money. Follow you know, the like money. people, people lie, but money doesn't. So people get on TV and they're going to lie. Corporations are notorious for it. Sure. One of my famous ones is the uh, Burns, Burns, uh, or Bear Stern CEO, and he was on TV, uh, and this is during the financial crisis. He right like, before. Oh. Yeah, right. He's like, no, no, there's nothing wrong, but we saw put buying all the way out of the money on there, indicating something different. A couple days later, they're, Tank. they're, right they're gone. But he's on TV. Oh, yeah, everything's fine. Well, so was Bernanke, the, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. was like, yeah, we're probably not headed for a recession. Everything is fine. Yeah, right. I mean, I, it, what are they supposed to say? Right. I mean, yeah, but that's where you have to be able to kind of read between the lines. So do you think now having the experience that you have, is it possible, because there's a lot of people that are older, you know, mm -hmm. or even older than like, like our parents, they're in the mindset I think of like, as an individual, you cannot trade and make money and create a living for yourself. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that as an individual, you can now because of technology and because of the advances, you can find an instrument, find a market and find yourself an edge? Absolutely, with technology and the cost of commissions now, absolutely. Now, you had asked earlier, like, why uh, is it better? I think the question was, is it, can you make money as a trader? Or, like, is why the story was about me going to the firm and why not trade for yourself? Trading your own money sucks. It's tough. Uh, it's all you. Yeah. Uh, the reason why other people trade other people's money is because they're good at it and, you, and it's not just your capital. Right. Now, the individual can, but I often say it's not, shouldn't be your main source. Sure. A lot of people want to trade for a living and there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, a lot of people can, but it's just the, the aspect of being able to take profits from your account as well and be able to live off of it and also be able to uh, withstand a drawdown is challenging. And for a lot of people, it takes time to get to that level. I'm not saying that's not the dream, but trading is actively you know, managing money. And having one source, it's like you know, anything in business, it's like having one product. Like you're not gonna be a successful business just having one product. So if oftentimes, I mean, I tell people, and yes, you can do it, but it's very, very challenging to be able to do it. And, and it takes experience. I mean, floor traders, for instance, I, I, there's a, an old floor trader that I knew, and he retired, but he was still trading futures until he was 92, 93. Wow. Yeah. He was calling them in. He was an old school guy. Dude. Trading in futures, just because he loved him. the activity. He just right. loved the engagement. Right. but. I mean, once it, once it gets into you, then it's hard to get out of you. When you mentioned handling a drawdown, I think that's where a lot of people get into trading. Again, irrelevant of the market. They get into this and they think it's month over month gains. Mm -hmm. They are not ready for that first red month. And normally when they have their first couple of losses, it leads to tilt. So when you are now, I know you write your email every day. You have mm -hmm. a huge newsletter that you speak to. But you don't speak too often in the newsletter about how to handle some of these hardships that come in trading. I feel like that's a huge issue. So could you speak to some of the guys that are struggling maybe with their first period of drawdown on the psychological tips that can allow you to push through? Yeah, the thing is, is understand the outcome. So, so many people have this problem with the drawdown because they're not just not, they're not expecting it. I, I'm, I have a drawdown right now. <laughs> I'm short the market. I'm as short as I ever want to be at this point because the market keeps going. It's like a slow freight train as it goes higher, higher, oh, higher. I'm, I'm short futures on the uh, ES. So these contracts were out of the money and they just slowly continue to go higher, 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 higher. And it goes, um, and those, those, those options go higher and higher as well. Uh, so essentially I'm short the marketplace and the market keeps going higher and higher. 
But that's the drawdown. You have to be able to withstand the market. I, I call it dancing with the marketplace. So to your question specifically, so many people are not able to understand outcomes. They're only focused on like, I'm gonna buy this and sell that. Okay, what happens if that doesn't happen? What happens like with my positioning, like I have these positions on, what happens if the market goes up 10 points? What happens if market goes up 20 points? What happens if market goes up 30 points? At that point, am I comfortable with that risk, with that loss at that? And if I'm not, then that size is too big. So just understanding that structure of managing risk overall. Sure. So a lot of traders imagine that that come to you or watch and in myself as well, they're trading direction. They're trading like one, one position or whatnot. Yep. You still have to understand what happens if I lose. Yeah. What happens if I win? And that's the best way to start with it. So if I lose and if I lose money, am I comfortable with that? Okay, then that is how you can handle it. Now, you can justify the trade then. You can justify it. Now, how do you get through it? Losing sucks. I mean, it just sucks. You know, like being short the market right now just sucks. <laughs> um, but that's just part of, it's part of the business. It's like being upset that you're mad or that you get something wrong. Right. You know, like, oh man, I made a, I made a dumb choice. Cause that's what trading is at the end of the day. It's right. just, if you, if you it's lose, just, it's, it's just making decisions. It's yeah. making bets like in any, like your everyday life. Yeah. Like, oh, I did that. That was a bonehead move. Okay. I didn't, I learned to move on. So there's not like a secret sauce to it. No. Uh, but the one thing would be is this the the amount of loss, and that's something that a lot of people are not understanding. What could happen is that if I lose, am I comfortable with that loss? And if I'm not, then that size is too big, and I need to reduce it down. I like that answer. Yeah. Could you look at it also from a perspective of the thesis of the trade? You're short right now. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to let this run for 50 ticks against me. I don't know if I'm going to think that markets. Will move high. If the market wants to move higher than 50 ticks, my thesis is invalidated. So would you look at it from a framework of, like, because I'm a technical trader, I know, let's say, we want to hold 5,200. I'm going to be short under 5,200. If we're above 5,200, probably shouldn't be short anymore. So is that basically what you're saying? The, is that the definition of having that structure and framework around the idea to withstand the loss? Because then you can back yourself in based on the position size. If I know my stops should be here, that's where my idea is invalid. I can position size myself so that I can stomach the loss at that point. So I run multiple strategies. Oh, I know you do. So my one strategy is I, so I look at my options positions as a whole. Okay. So typically I, as a whole, am delta wise, I am short. So a lot of times I have, I'm selling on the E, like specifically on the ES, I'm selling calls and puts. I haven't been selling puts recently because the market just keeps going up and it's going to go lower, but it just hasn't. So, and that's, that, that's the odd thing too, or the tough thing is that like, sometimes you need to be doing things even though that you have your opinion that you, have to, you should be doing and you don't do it, like selling the puts because it would have benefited and help with that positioning. So I'm selling stuff that's out because the aspect is, is that markets go, typically they go up, down, and sideways. Yep. So I'm just selling essentially junk outside sure, sure. and over time because of time decay i'll be able to buy those back well when you get a kind of a runaway market like it has been the last three months that becomes pretty problematic on the call side and um so your question was like on management side of it so one of the things i will do like on this one specifically on these i roll them out for a little bit more time eventually to catch when markets do roll over because markets just don't melt up, no. but they have been, <laughs> even though they don't melt up, but they do melt up because it's, it's exactly what's been happening. So that's how I, I manage it overall on that, uh, that, on that approach. Why do you say that, that markets are melting up right now, but they typically don't do that? Like you're saying it has to pull back. Well, what we're seeing, like for instance, like on NVIDIA here, is um, we're, it's a one stock market right now. I mean, before it was the MAG7, then became the Fab Four. And now it's, it's just the one, the okay. AI one. Educate me, because I'm still thinking it's MAG7. Yeah, it's not. It's not. We, you have NVIDIA that's just all the order flow. So what you're seeing is it, really interesting aspect of overall marketplace. So what you're seeing with like NVIDIA is zero DTE options. And what's happening is that you're seeing buying of these calls, which means market makers then have to hedge. And they're, what they're selling is on the other side of it, and they're using the order flow from NVIDIA to drive up the whole marketplace. Interesting. Yeah, because the- Can you explain that really quick? How does order flow into one stock drive up the whole marketplace? Well, the S&P 500 is weighted, 
And right now... Heavily weighted in these seven. Yeah, heavily weighted. And when we're seeing that before it was a seven that was moving this market higher. But now with NVIDIA, it's just you have all this order flow and just pushing that stock higher. And that's moving the whole index as a whole. How could I look at that? So right now, people know me as a Forex trader. I don't mm-hmm. trade Forex as much anymore. I trade futures now and I've been trading CFDs with these prop firms. That's ending. The CFD thing we'll talk about in a little bit, that's ending. And now I'm definitely going to be shifting, it seems like, towards more futures. Mm -hmm. How can a futures trader see what you're talking about, that the money has shifted from the 7 into NVIDIA? What what tool can I use? What do I? Well, if you're trading futures, you're going to be looking at the ES. Yes. So the ES is going to be driven by that. Yes. So market makers are going to be... But how do I know when it changes is what I'm saying. So right now it's NVIDIA. What happens when it goes back to the MAG7 and Apple starts getting more order flow? What would I look at? What tool... What options tool can I look at to see them, or if it's even not just an, an options tool? You can see it on the option statistics. You can see the order flow for the day based on like how much order okay. flow of overall is going into just volume, just volume, volume of order. Yeah, just volume, just going into. So if I see Nvidia is top on that list of volume from options orders, I can then assume that day or that period of time Nvidia is driving the direction of the overall market because of how the S&P is weighted in these seven stocks or something right, right now. Right. So right now, specifically, every it's the AI craze. Yeah. So you just have zero, you have traders, just individual traders just jumping into NVIDIA and just driving that all the way. And you have uh, just the natural order flow as well because market makers then have to cover and buy that back and you're just forcing, it's like a snowball effect. It just continues to force it higher. Mm-hmm. And that weighs the overall index. And you have um, firms as well using that order flow from the S&P 500 Got it. Interesting. So it, it really does all, in a way, work together. The options flow can drive the direction of a market in a way, is what you're saying. Yeah, it was the belief that stocks drive options, but it's really options, honestly, that drive. It's like chicken or egg kind of approach. Yeah. I mean, options are a distribution of outcomes, and there's a flexibility of it. Sure. So a stock is this you know, binary, an option you have the flexibility of what you want and also not the, the same cost as well of Got the it. stock. So that's why you see a lot of interest in it. Right, because you can buy, if you think NVIDIA is going to be higher, you can get those contracts at a cheaper price than it would be to buy a share of NVIDIA. Right, and if NVIDIA goes up $20 in a day or $30 in a day and you're trading zero DTE, that's where all the hot option order flow is going in. Well, you buy those zero DTEs and it's just... It's almost like a printing press for some of these people that I watch trading. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's nothing, nothing wrong with it. It's just, it just scares the hell out of me. It scares me too because it's like when, when guys like yourself who have experience, this is not the first bubble you've seen run up. Not that AI itself is a bubble because I, I think we all agree AI is important. But like, Oh, no, it's a bubble. You think it's a bubble? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's on a fever pitch right now. It's so crazy. I mean, like NVIDIA, it's, it's, just, it's nuts. It is. It's SMCI. I, I use ChatGPT. Yeah. It's not the best. No. I don't know how it's going to change the world. Right. I mean, I can see concepts of it. It's definitely not the best. But it ain't Gemini. Like, I, I understand the flow to it. I mean, it reminds me of the dot-com aspect of it a little bit. 100%. I mean, I've just, of 20 years in the marketplace, I've just never seen anything like this really? in the market. Yeah. I, I, and I've asked other trader, floor traders that I've same known. Thing? They're the same thing as well. Really? Yeah. Just, it, it is a different animal just because of the structure of the marketplace. Do you not believe like not to get too lost in the NVIDIA sauce, do you not then think that the NVIDIA chips are going to be everywhere? Well, right now they're leader, but other Microsoft, Meta, they're everyone's... Going to, they're going to catch up. They're trying to catch up to them. Yeah. So it's only a matter of time that they have this moat. They've got the hole in the industry. Right. Yeah. I mean, I remember when Zoom went from $100 to $500. Zoom is going to take it over. Right. And then there, it's $65 now. Yep. I mean, I wanted to post this chart the other day because I'm like... You I, made I rem- a post about Zoom earlier... Yeah, I mean, I like Zoom overall as a play to get yeah. taken over, but yeah. it's, it's been a dog. Yeah, it, it, has. Know, it, it has not been. I, mean, I like Robin Hood as well yeah. to be taken over because there's just no, there's no um, innovation in fintech. Let me ask another kind of side question. You talked about how you had worked with IPOs before. Mm-hmm. How come so many IPOs in the last year come out at a higher price and then fall and never go back to that price, like Airbnb or Coinbase? You want to get funded. I can help you do that. Through our Black Shirt Club mentorship program, we've helped over 150 different traders in the last year pass their funding challenges, get paid out, get their initial refund, and most importantly, 
keep their funded account. The habits and the strategies that we're going to walk you through are what will last you a lifetime. So if you're looking to make a big change in your trading, you're tired of spinning your wheels and losing money, click the link below, book a call with me, and let's see if the Black Shirt Club is a good fit for you. We include a year of Tradezilla. We include private weekly coaching sessions. We include the starter pack. There's a ton of stuff you get when you join the Black Shirt Club. It's really like our one-stop shop. If you're looking to take trading seriously and you want to be in a small group setting surrounded by other professional traders, people who have been in the markets much longer than you probably, click the link below. Let's see if the Black Shirt Club is a good fit for you. Now let's get back to the video. Other uh, dogs? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's Define just... Define that. What does that mean for the people that don't know what that means? Uh, so... Because all of us on the retail side feel like that's big money offloading at its IPO price. They oh, get it out. Is. It, it is. Okay. Oh, that's, that's what an IPO is. It's a liquid... That's, that's what it, it is. It's a right? liquidation it's event. so that these people that got in early can right. cash out. Right. And sell to the idiots on Robinhood. Well, it's not necessarily before, like, okay, Google came out. That was a, there's been successful IPOs. What happens is, is the stack that a lot of these companies have going into public offerings okay. is a lot different now. Okay. So the value is just, there's just for, at the time it gets to an IPO, there's just not enough meat on the bone anymore for a lot, a lot of the players. So an IPO is at 60, it's really worth 20. I mean, the market uh, price always matters. Sure. But I mean, when you look at Airbnb, I mean, okay, Uber. Yeah. You know, it took a while for Uber yeah. to get to get going, but yeah. that one—that's an IPO that flopped, but has came back. It's come back. Uh, it's true. Lift as well. Yep. So a lot of those, and I think the cycle of when that happened as well, it was kind of a fever pitch. You had a lot for of sure. what blank check companies, yep. which is uh, SPACs. Yep. Which but that was another thing that I was part of SPACs before. Were you? Yeah. That I, was my big stock trade in 2020. Was Virgin Galactic, oh. which was a SPAC. Yeah, that was a 15 to 55. Yeah. Back down to 15. Back up to fifty, and then now, four dollars, eight dollars, something like that. Yeah, those those things were uh, just a frenzy. Frenzy. Yeah, <laughs> they don't make any sense if you understood the structure of it. You're like, why would I ever want to to invest in something like that? To, but they're trading instruments. There's nothing wrong sure. with that. You know, like you were saying earlier about like people's books or you know what they say. I mean, there's we had Tim on. You know, yeah. Tim. Tim's very successful at trading penny stocks. Right. I don't like trading penny stocks. There's a lot of gotchas with it, like halts. And for sure. secret offerings that come out. Press after, releases. Yeah, you know, and stuff like that. But they're volatility products, and that's my, that's my point. When you understand things of, like, volatility, like, that's what options are, volatility products. Sure. Forex is volatility. That's why you have the leverage on Forex. Because currencies don't really move that much. So when people here are like, oh, my God, Forex is just so risky because of the leverage. Yes and no. It has to have leverage. Because it ain't moving. Because it ain't moving. So you have to have the leverage to be able to make money. And if you don't have the leverage, then you ain't going to make any money. So give me your thoughts on the Forex market. It's very global. Yep. I don't have any problem with it. Okay. I often, if I'm going to trade currencies, uh, I'm going to use the futures yeah. just because I like that. Um, You're also like brought up on that, basically. Yeah, I'm brought up. And I also, I'm not like big. I, it's not, I'm not, oh, this is, Regulation is good. Yeah. There's a lot of overregulation. But then sure. with Forex, you have a lot of different firms, and it's just hard to know who and what the firm is, especially when they're offshore. 100%. You can't do your typical due diligence. No. So that makes it very problematic. Yeah. And I worked at a firm where we offered managed uh, Forex products. Okay. So I worked with a lot of different uh, firms over the years, and I know that they take the other side of the trade. Um, and I don't necessarily disagree with it, but a lot of people are not okay with that. I, under, I understand their perspective on that too. Yeah. So, all right. I, so now futures. What's that? Futures versus forex. Give me your perspective on futures. Well, futures are just a cleaner product. You get the leverage and you got the CME centralized. You get centralized. It's, That's what I think is the big pro, personally. Forex. We'll look at Euro USD from FXCM, which mm -hmm. used to be an American broker. Now they're offshore. You can look at that same asset, same currency pair on a five different brokers, and they all have slightly different pricing. Mm -hmm. When you look at a futures contract, it all clears at the CME at the end of the day. You know where that pricing is coming from. I think that's a huge pro to it. Am I right in that? Yeah, that's, it makes things less complicated yeah. and more, uh, more understanding. And you get the liquidity part of it as well. Yeah. So it's just, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just you get bad actors in there, and it's just hard, especially on a global stage, to figure out who is good and who's bad. Well, I mean, now you're seeing it more than ever. So are you, how much do you follow in the online space, this prop firm funding company stuff that's been going on? Because I want to know your- I follow it pretty closely. Okay, I, so give me your opinion on it. Uh, I'm not a fan of it. Tell me why. Um, 
there's always problems. Yeah. Um, there's problems getting your money out. Yep. I'm very skeptical. I think it's, if you could, if it were on the prop firms that I knew of, you had to work at the location. They're that's, not how gonna, I, that's where I learned too. Yeah. They're, they're not going to give you money to sit at home. No. You had to come into the office, you had to trade and they, and they, you had to learn their way Yep. and you had to sit in front of the computer and you had to be in the office that's exactly how until, until you were ultra successful, you could possibly have a setup at your home, right? No firm is this going to give you money. It, it just well, I think so. Let's 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 be clear. These C, these firms that are allowing U.S. traders mm-hmm. to trade CFDs, which were banned, regulated brokers in the U.S. could not do CFDs since 2008, since Dodd Frank. These brokers that are set up offshore, calling themselves prop firms, are not really prop firms. There's like it's like this simulated casino. It feels like where they're giving you an account. Most of the time, it's demo. And mm-hmm. then they're paying you out if you trade well with the people behind you who have failed, right. which is not a prop firm at all. A prop firm, like you said, I worked at T3. Are you familiar with T3? Yeah. I worked there with Scott Redler for a year and a half. They were a traditional prop firm. They were closing down the space in New York and sending everyone virtual because it was just the way it was going. I was there four years ago. Right. But they made you trade their way. They sized you up as you got better, not mm-hmm. just, oh, pay us more money and you get more size. So it's, right. it's totally different than the old school prop model. Right, So it's these funding companies is what they call themselves. Mm-hmm. And now, I don't know if you saw last week, MetaQuotes, which is MetaTrader 4, MetaTrader 5, is not allowing U.S. clients at all. We cannot use MetaTrader at all anymore. Why is that? They're saying that MetaQuote, I don't know exactly. So everyone knows, I'm not insider. I don't know nothing. But I, from what I see is that they got complaints from the CFTC to stop accepting U.S. Cu- customers for a multitude of reasons. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to speculate, but it's coming from a regulatory agency saying you cannot accept U.S. clients anymore due to the fact that they allow CFD trading when CFD trading is supposed to be illegal here. Okay. Yeah. So now all these firms are trying to find a workaround to still onboard U.S. clients. when in reality, I'm just like, go to futures. Right. It's the same thing. Trading SPX 500 or trading the ES, it's the same thing, just different Tick values. We have micros now. Micros I mean, are a game changer for so game many people. Changer. You know, the thing is, is I don't understand. I started in the futures market. Mm-hmm. We had options, two option pits in the mercantile exchange. The big, sure. the big, uh, the, uh, the big exchange was the board of options exchange. Okay. Uh, but we had option, two option pits in the floor there. Okay. So I started with futures. That's where I, but it wasn't micros. It wasn't micros. No, no. These are big boy contracts. Right. But with the introduction of micros now in most products, you have, ES, Bitcoin, and so forth, anyone can trade it, but there's just not the interest no. in it. And I don't know why. Because once you try it and you learn something new, yeah. you learn that the ticks are different, right? It's mm-hmm. not like it's 25 cent movement, blah, 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 blah. Once you learn it, you're like, I'm having no slippage. Right. I have great spreads. Why wouldn't I do this? Now, there's a couple of firms that are switching and they're taking that prop, use that word loosely, the funding company model, and they're applying it in the futures world. I'm interested to see how that goes over the long term. There's a couple. There's a company named uh, Top Step. Mm-hmm. They're in Chicago, mm-hmm. and they are like official with the CME and everything. I'm curious to see if more firms follow their lead because I feel like that's the way to offer American clients the idea of trading with someone else's money. I, I'm just reluctant on it. I, I just have heard and know too many stories of people getting paid. Not getting paid. Not getting paid, yeah. Yeah, people not getting paid. Withdrawal out. issues. Yep. I mean, if you think... It, you, if oh, you, you would, reserve the... They reserve the right to just be like, yep, you think you owe, we owe you 20 grand? Actually, you broke a rule that we didn't tell you about and we're not paying you. Right. Out. I mean, you had you had problems at that uh, at prop firms as well. Sure. You know, if you took trades that weren't... weren't You're part, not getting paid on those. You, you ain't going to get paid on them. No. And you probably may get fired for it. Yeah. So, I, I understand, the, understand the concept of trading and leveraging other people's money. I see it... Other people on Instagram that supposedly have funded accounts and they make it sound so easy. And so I'm like, uh, I just, it almost like, it makes me cringe because it's like, I don't want to call anyone out. Right. But, but you should, you'd get more attention. We get attention when we call those people out. Yeah. It's not my job to do that. I know me neither. And that's why I never pick. And that's why I've never beefed with people on the internet because it's just not worth it. Well, I'm not, it's not my job one to do that. It doesn't make me more money too. Yeah. It doesn't make me, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would just say I would be really reluctant on that okay. to, to do that. So I mean, we'll, trade your own money, you have much more 
much more leverage, much more flexibility. Um, Should I go and become a professional so I get the tax advantages of it if I'm going to trade futures? There's a lot of debate about that. I mean, at first you probably shouldn't because most people are not understanding of like how taxes are and you have right. to find the right setup as well, right. like right person. Yeah. Again, trading is risk, understanding risk and what you're comfortable with. Taxes yep. are the same thing as well. There is a book of the tax code. You get some uh, CPAs that are, be, are just going to go by the, by the book of like not trying to do anything. And you get ones that are going to go really close and, and try to figure out every little detail. And as you, as a taxpayer, you have to figure, realize, what am I comfortable with? Right. Because getting audited is not fun. No. There's nothing wrong with it. No. But, but it ain't fun. A, but it's a process. It's a process. And you got to be able to back up everything that you have. And, and it, because they're gonna, you're guilty until innocent yeah, at that gotta, point. You have to prove your innocence with right. them. I have a good accountant, finally, that actually trades options. Mm -hmm. And like he gets what I have talked about. He's been my accountant for four years. He's a great guy. And he's, I've sent other traders to them, and he's helped them too. So having that team around you is definitely important. Yeah, definitely. Having, having that team. But that's like next level stuff. I mean, like you could get started with a traditional account. I mean, you can start with your with your IRA, start trading and start getting engaged with options. And there's nothing wrong with putting money in a retirement account. I know like a lot of people and it shouldn't be your first move, but it is what it is. And, and your retirement account does grow tax-free and that is a benefit if you use a Roth. But you should also have a, a traditional margin account as well. And if you can get to a level where you are very successful, then yeah, you should probably consider the benefits of using a professional account, but then right. you have to, you're going to get it into issues of then having to pay for data. Sure. And a little more hula hoops to jump yeah. through. Do you find that like win rate as a trader for you as an options trader specifically, does the amount of trades you win matter? No, you can have a, <laughs> it's a, it's a really on the management side. I mean, you can have a very successful, uh, let's just say, I mean, you could look, you could sell out of the money puts and calls have a, a 10 delta, meaning yeah. that it has a 90% probability of expiring worthless. But if you're not getting paid for that risk, you're not going to make any money off of it. So it's really on the management side of it. And also markets change as well. Like you can have really good years doing the same thing, and then you can have not so good years right. with the same strategy. And it's just because of how markets change. And this, sometimes you have a windfall and sometimes you don't. And that's the other thing too with people. But you were talking about you know, dealing with drawdowns and handling losses. That's the other thing. Because you could do the right things mm -hmm. sometimes in the market, oftentimes in the wrong, and still be wrong. Still be wrong. Still, still be wrong. Money. Yeah. And it's it's ch tough, you know, when you are by yourself and you're trying to navigate the marketplace, and you're not quite sure exactly what you're seeing. Even I mean, as on my, my level of experience, I still I, I I go to more experienced traders that I've known that have traded, and I, I ask them questions. I'm like, you know, am I the only one that sees this? They're like, no, 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 we, we see, I see it as well. I'm like, okay. Okay, I'm not crazy. Yeah, I'm not crazy. Right. Who are some of the influential traders that you've either read or worked with that maybe you could share for the audience to check out their books or check out their work as well? Uh, so Pax is on Twitter. Pax is the man. Yeah, uh, he was very aggressive in the pit. <laughs> Did you work in the pit at the same time as him? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. So you know Crudelli then? Huh? Anthony Crudelli? Yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy too. Mm -hmm. Well, the firm I worked for was Spike Trading. Really? Mm-hmm. And that's... Um, Spike trading and I clear for FC Stone as well. So you were like right with them. Yep. That's crazy. Small yeah. world. I, I was just a young kid. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I didn't still, really... That's cool. That's yeah. awesome. So I, I usually, you know, look at those guys. Like Pax, very successful guy. And a guy that has been on the top and then had to rebuild and understand the difference of like using screens and how to approach it. Um, but yeah, those are, the, those are kind of the, the traders that I usually look after. I mean, then there's also professional ones. And oftentimes you don't hear about professional. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know some of them, but they're very, they're very quiet. Yeah. I mean, Wall Street's motto is get rich quietly. Is that the motto? Yep. Not do cocaine in the bathroom? Well, you could do cocaine. Okay. But just get rich quietly. Got it. Yeah. You could do all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, that's the whole, you know, not being flashy. Yeah. I mean, that's, you look at BlackRock and all of them. I mean, like, it's they try to keep a low key. They don't even want you to know their name. Yeah. They don't want to be in the news. Exactly. Yeah, it's a good point. Do you ever recommend those like traditional trading books like Trading in the Zone, Mark Douglas, that kind of stuff? Yeah, those are good ways to understand and, and get engaged with it. But the best experience is just getting 
you know, getting behind the screens because markets are always changing the market structure. And I, I keep saying that, but market structure, and what I mean specifically by that is this like how order flow and uh, trading overall in the market is. You know, like people, when people think when I say like the market's going to go lower, they're like, oh, it's going to crash. I'm like, no, it's not going to crash because the structure of the marketplace ain't like that. You know, it, it will go lower. Right. It's not just going to crash. Right. Um, that's people get that conception or like they hear doom and gloom stuff and the market's just going to, you know, crash on there. It's not really, I mean, it can accelerate because of how, how the market overall is, but there's a lot, there's a lot of money in the marketplace, like trillions of dollars online. It's very sophisticated and it's just, just not going to, right. To just say it's going to go to zero or yeah, low, it's, that much dramatically lower. It's not, it's very difficult. That's what Crudelli said on the podcast and I had him on. He said, the market needs immense pressure to go lower. Otherwise, natural market drift says up. Right, right. And um, things that had happened before, the market fixes. Mm. Crash the Black Monday. Never happened again. Never happened again. Right. Financial crisis ain't gonna happen, happen again. again. Yep. Right. Yep. So I mean, yes, there's issue with issues with That's commercial. That's such a good point, bro. Issues with commercial real estate. Sure. But those black swan events, they're black swan events for a reason. Correct. <laughs> there, sure, there may be something that comes, but I mean, the things that has been thrown at this marketplace over the last five years, I mean, like. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I, I don't know what could make the market go lower. I mean, it will go lower, but I mean. Even COVID couldn't hold it down. Right. That, then we can argue about like you didn't hold down Powell's money printer. Well, yeah, you got, you know, free money and you still have money sloshing around. For sure. For sure. For sure. You st that's what the whole aspect of where you just see this rotation of money. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, that's the market structure is that you have so many of these different uh, products now that are involved in the marketplace where it's just not like, you know, one, one or the Heavily other. weighted in one thing that could tip it over. Yeah, exactly. Right. When you look back at the past, we've had periods throughout history where when we were speaking before, the 401k mindset could end you in retirement with less money than it should. Mm -hmm. There's been periods where the market hasn't made new highs once in the, I mean, in the last hundred years or so, where it went like 50 something years, I believe, did not make a new high. Then after that, it went like 20 something years without a new high. Then it was less, it was like eight years. And now that window keeps getting smaller and smaller of how long the market goes without making new highs. And the point of the graphic that I saw that showed me this was saying that this QE that we are still living within mm -hmm. from the early 2000s till now, that is why the market doesn't have these prolonged periods with a lack of a new all-time high. Do you buy into that? The lack of a new time all-time high because so, of no, like you see how like we we haven't entered a period where it's, there's sustained sideways movement mm -hmm. across the broad market. We are consistently making all-time highs if you look at the last hundred years, and we're making all-time highs at a faster pace. Is what this mark and it, it was just backing the idea that it's happening because of the Fed. It's happening because of the easy money and the QE. Do you agree with that? Well, I mean, partially indexes are manipulated because they take the bad ones out and add new ones in, just like they did on the Dow last week with Amazon. Right. So I mean. So naturally, the the indexes are going to drift higher because they're subbing out the bad ones. They're subbing out the bad ones. That's yes. a good point. So I mean, people say it's market manipulation. Eh, okay, but I mean that's how indexes work. Sure. Um, also, how money is managed as well is you give it to Wall Street, they take it, and they're going to buy. That's they they collect fees. That's all they do. Right. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just understanding the game. Yeah. That's how they make money, and that's why being a bear is kind of tough for the most part, right? Oh, I mean, like. <laughs> I don't know who's a short seller anymore. There's, you, it's impossible to be a short only seller. Lucci. But only Lucci. Only <laughs> Lucci. Well, I mean, Tim started out as Tim Sykes started out as yeah. short selling. Yeah. Uh, he has flipped his strategy. Yeah. Uh, because of how the markets work. Yep. Um, but any, I don't. Chanos is the last notable one, and I think he just folded his. Did he? Folded his uh, fund short selling wise and return the, the rest so there's, of the you're saying there's very few even funds that are short biased now oh yeah i mean because like, everyone just realized it's so hard i don't know how you how do you fight it i mean people who fought tesla for so long got killed killed i mean people who are again nvidia, NVIDIA are killed killed i think there's three billion in uh unrealized floating short floating short yeah dude that's all those memes of everybody with like the train steamrolling the nvidia shorts yeah yeah, it's exactly it. I mean, it's just it, it's unbelievable, but it's hard to get short a marketplace that is getting flooded with money, money. And even uh, with rates are where they are now. I mean, it's better than it was before, but it's still relatively low overall when you look at the wide. Oh, interest rates for mortgages used to be 20 percent. Yeah. In the 80s, I think 17 percent. So it's overall. I mean, people are giddy about getting four and a half percent on their money. Like, oh, my God, it's the best thing ever. 
I mean, inflation is Don't that- Don't even talk to you about this. I could talk about this for an hour. People are hyped up about 5% in a Marcus uh, you know account I mean? at Goldman Sachs when inflation is probably still above 5%. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not even if inflation isn't. The cost of your goods is not going to come back down, and your 5% a year is not going to make it so you- Well, can- groceries are 10% higher now. Right. Gas fluctuates, but gas is more expensive. Your utilities are more expensive. Eating, I mean, dude, you can't even Wal- eat- Walmart came out and said, uh, we are seeing less, people are spending less money and buying more groceries. <laughs> spending yeah. less and buying more groceries. It's crazy. Paying more for groceries, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, crazy. So this leads us to our, one of our final points. Yeah. The call roll strategy that was the viral video. Everybody get your call roll on. Everybody get your roll on. I like it. <laughs> when you positioned that video, I know we talked about how you are a master of like really trying to understand content. I know you know Ryan and the whole thing you were in St. P for where I live, right? So I understand you're looking at it from a perspective of like, let's pitch this hook, let's get them sucked. But the whole video, I found it, like I told you, it actually explains it perfectly. It's mm-hmm. very easy to understand what you're talking about. Right. So the first question, and for everybody that doesn't know, there's this viral video, it's on Josh's Instagram, you can go watch it. Over a million views now, right? Uh, All together, it's over 10 million. That's what I'm saying, super yeah. viral, so super viral. Yeah. He talks about this 1,250% over two years mm-hmm. with the call roll strategy. Why is it so- 200% hard? this year. 200% this year. Yeah. Why is it so hard for people to already, January, February? Yeah. That's amazing. It's just an unbelievable right, free trade market. Markets, right, market all time high. That's why I see comments on there still. And people are like, well, it only works in a bull market. And I go, hmm, a bull market, huh? Right. And <laughs> literally, you know, you send them back the graph of how long bear markets even last when we have them. They're so inconsequential because we're normally bullish. So it's like, this is the strategy as an options trader that to me, it seems like it could be your income. This is the bread and butter. As long as we're kind of moving up, you're going to make some money. Some years, 1,000%, some years, 200%, whatever it is. Why do you think people are resistant to this simplicity of this idea? You know, the interesting thing is that it's no different than buying the S&P 500 and just buying it. Right. And holy, that, that, it's a passive approach. Well, you lose them because they talk about rolls. Roll what? My yeah. bread roll? Like, yeah. no. Well, the roll is a, an active managers. Right. You know, like you, if you buy a future, you eventually have to roll it if you hold it. 100%. It's, it's a roll. Now, rolling could be two different things. You're just rolling it into the future. You could be short an option and roll sure. it, or you could be long an option and roll it. Sure. Um, but it's interesting because that presentation that I did, mm-hmm. I talked about three different strategies. I talked about selling puts. Right. I talked about that approach. Yep. And how simple it is. Because the concept is, is that, I mean, we, you asked this earlier about like my approach or like what I think is more successful, buying options. You didn't say this specifically, but like you said about essentially playing direction versus selling options. And that, so most people buy options and they're playing direction. I'm, an, I'm typically an option seller, um, but most people think if they come into the world of, it's usually one or the other. And that's the interesting thing about options. Right. You get people who are like, selling options is the only way to make money, theta, 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 that's all it is. And then you got other people who are like, buy options and that's the only, you know, the only way, just to buy sure. options. Why would I want to sell something right. when I can make this much money sure. and I'm going to risk this to make that? Sure. It's all probabilities at the end of the day. 100%. I understand both sides of it, but why do you have to be one or the other? I'm both. I'm a buyer and seller. You have to be understanding of the marketplace. You want to, there's times where you want to be a buyer and there's times when you want to be a seller. Right now, it's better to be a buyer, like zero DT options. It's better to be a buyer of Z, zero DT options right now because of where volatility is at right. and the movements. When fear gets back into the marketplace, that's when you want to be more aggressive and not a buyer. You want to be a seller. Sure. I mean, NVIDIA just had their earnings. They had priced in 11% move. It moved 13%. Yep. Usually on earnings, it's about 75% probability that's going to stay within that range. Nope. Nope. Right through it. It reminds me of Netflix. But like you said, that's that unusual flow, right? And that was the third thing you talked about in that presentation was unusual option activity. Yeah. So back to the, the aspect of the, the, I had talked about three things on that Mm -hmm. selling options, the active role, and then the S and P 500. Most people think selling an option is better, but what I proved was just this active approach of buying the S and P 500, the SPY ETF, that this outperformed just buy and hold by a landslide and also just selling puts as well. Right. And yeah, it's a, it's a simple concept. It's, it, I mean, I hate to say it's simple. It's just, it's simple. It's to too you. good to be true. It's simple to you. Yeah, that it is. That's what I think it's those two aspects of why people are resistant to it. It's too good to be true. 1200% in two years, yeah. 200% already this year. It's too good to be true. They think that closed minded poor man's mindset for sure, but they also get turned off by complexity. They don't want to understand how to be long and short 
in theory of what you're saying, how I'm buying and selling the options. They don't want to understand how to do both sides of the coin. Well, it's active management. Right. But you they know, don't, buying, buying. They want it to be cute is what I'm saying. They just want to buy the calls and shut up. Yeah. Well, they don't want to. It, sure. They just want to buy calls. I, I don't know when you sell it. It's just like buying stock. Like right. when you sell it. Right. I mean, it, to me, that just, it, that doesn't make any sense. That's, what you, that's not how you use options to you. No, that's not how I use options. No. no. I mean, you could buy stock. Let's say you want a forever stock like Hershey's. Okay. Just buy the shares. Just buy shares. Okay. Stop buying. The options is to play the volatility. To, yeah, to, to, if you're going to be in the S&P 500, I just don't understand why you would want it to just buy the ETF and just hold it. Makes when you sense. could be more flexible sure. and have an active management approach. Sure. So the big one is, well, how does it do in a bear market? Okay, 2022 was down 66%. Oh, that's one of those aspects. Can you handle... 66% drawdown. Yeah, 66 But when you have things that make outstanding returns... When you make 1,250% in two years... Right. You're going to have a bigger drawdown. When you have outperformance, you're going to have, have a drawdown. It goes on both sides of the coin. Right. Yeah. But are you going to be able to deal with 66% out of one year drawdown when the whole 20 years it's been up? Right. You're up 10,000% over 20 years. Right. I mean, right. And it's just an, an active management approach. That's why, well, what about a stop loss? What about this? Well, one, stop losses don't work. Two, it's an option has a built-in stop loss. So you, let's just say the option's $5, you buy that. It's active management by the aspect of either you're taking a profit at 50%. So you take the profit and then you reopen it again. And you adjust back it to the at the money strike. Or after 21 days, what are, you could have a profit on there and you can also have a loss. So just because the 50% didn't trigger, you could still have like a 20% or a 5% or you could be down. Sure. But you just reestablish a new position, you roll it forward in a new 30 days it's the same concept of buying the index. Same concept. And, and how money flows into the marketplace, the market bias is higher. Why do you say stop losses don't work? Well, an option. Okay. Um, what just came out recently? Uh, P-A-N-W. Okay. Was after earnings, it was down like, it got hammered. People think that stop loss is this magical thing that's going to protect them. And something like that, you have a stock. And those stop losses, I mean, the stock gapped lower. So it's just, the aspect of a stop loss is, is it useful? I mean, you should have a position size that you should already know. I mean, if you're, if you're day trading and you have massive leverage, yes, yeah, I mean, you, that's not the same thing. But I guess what you're saying is in a market, in a market that can jump your stop loss and not give a fuck about it, why right. would you even have it? Well, yeah, that's in that situation. Saying. So like, okay, so if I, I had a stop loss on my $5 option, my $5 option could only go f to zero. Right. Okay, let's say I had a, um, a, my stop loss. Okay, the S&P 500 gaps lower, blows through that. It's, it's already, a, I mean, it blows through it. I mean, the, the stop loss didn't really happen sure. because you have, uh, typically in like equities, you have, what's, you have equity risk. You have some kind of event. You have special news. So you have to be understanding of that as well. So a lot of people who like to sell options don't understand the difference of products. And I hate, like I, when I say, like they don't understand, like I hate that approach because it feels like I'm talking down to people. But it's just different. Like when you trade an ETF, mm -hmm. there's difference of an equity. Sure. So a lot of people like to use the same approach that they would use with an equity versus an index or an ETF. And they're, they're different products. There's different risks that are involved. 100%. So let's just say you had... Um, a stop loss in NVIDIA. Well, NVIDIA could open $100 lower the next day. It could have something with China. 100%. Whatever the news is, all of a sudden it opens lower. What's that stop, stop loss that you had, it, it's not going to, yeah, it'll trigger, but it's going to. Down there. Yeah. Yeah. You'll get, op if, if it stops at 50, you're going to get picked up at 35. Whatever. And I'm old enough to remember when the flash crash happened and I was watching my screens. And if I had, and if you had stop losses in when the flash crash happened, that would have triggered. And you would have been knocked out of prices after they just had rebounded as well. So that's always a scary thing for me. So if you have, let's say you own equity and, they're, and it's a long-term 10-year investment, I just, I'm, I, the risk, you should understand the full amount of risk. And you would hate to get knocked out of something at a bad price because of some glitch or some issue. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but it is, possibility it happened to me i was holding a couple of altcoins with kraken the broker mm -hmm. and they pinned me out with a stop in profit i was in at 30 cents we're at 75 cents so i take some off i lock a stop 
Kraken pins down. No other brokerage has a pin on the chart, just my broker. My broker stopped everybody out who had stops locked or stops in that area. We get taken out. I'm out of the position. I can't get that price again. Right. Yeah. So I totally understand what you're saying. So sometimes that stop loss depends on what you're trading and what the thesis is. Mm -hmm. All this comes back to what is the idea, right? Where is it invalid and where do you want it to go? But I totally understand too with what you're saying about like if you have a longer term idea, don't, don't make it more complicated. If you're trying to do something longer term, the stop loss could hurt you. Just buy and hold the stock. Don't even worry about the option because the is the, is an option a vehicle for long term investing or is an option? Yeah, you could. I mean, there's ways to structure. Sure, you could buy options. I guess that expire in a year. Yeah, I mean, there's ways I you structure options to to mimic synthetic of, of a long position over okay. time. I prefer options just because the the amount of capital that it requires versus buying a stock. Yeah, and having that risk again, I, I I worry about that stuff. The right. risk. I mean, I was short BP puts. During the BP spill, I lost a ton of money during that. It was my worst loss. Really? I lost, two of my biggest losses ever were short puts on MasterCard and BP. Really? What happened? Well, BP, I got in front of a train. <laughs> I, got, I got in front of a train, and the size continues to grow. So what happens is you get short a put, it's out of the money, it becomes in the money, it becomes, uh, it, it, we refer to it as getting teeth. It gets, te it gets very vicious. <laughs> um, MasterCard was I had sold these out of money puts and Congress had at that time came out with um, capping its rates. So these out of the money puts that were essentially like five cents, I just, because at that time I was just letting things expire, worthless, bad thing to do. Even though it's a high probability, this is what we're saying earlier, you can have a high probability of success or of making money, but if you're not getting paid on it or there's a 10% chance or you could have a 95% chance, but the amount of money you're collecting and you're not managing it, and all of a sudden that 5% does happen, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wallop you. So what happened was is that they had capped it, and um, that those sh shares sank lower, and it went through those puts, and I just had too much of a loss, or too, much, too big of a size too because heavy. of it. Yeah, so, I mean, we're talking about quarter of a quarter of a million. Yeah. What, with the BP, what was the thesis behind that? Why were you selling puts? Well, I didn't think it was so bad. Did you take that position after the spill? Yeah. I didn't think... I, I, after watching it and things were happening but you're like I, oh the fish will be fine the fish will be fine yeah but i didn't think it was going to be that i mean bp is going to bounce back huge company right right but it was just this became this over well because it got dramatized news, right it became when there's other spills going on throughout history this one that one captivated everybody correct and that's why I, I learned a big lesson on you know stepping in front of that kind of stuff so in that moment those big losses other than of course, being prepared for it, which is difficult for the next one. What do you take from it still today, since those two clearly stick with you, MasterCard and BP? Always, aside, so what we talked about in the beginning, understanding if this happens. The what, best thing to understand, like any decision in life, is like, what is the outcome? What happens if is the best thing? Do you think worst case? Uh, what happens if the worst thing happens? Worst thing happens, yeah. And then do you also think best case? Do you look at both sides? That's where you're saying yeah. you read your yeah, so risk. So when order. I look at, when I have my risk on, like I'm looking at my risk every day, if it goes another 10, Another 20. Am I comfortable with that? And I have to manage that. And so if not, size down. I have to cut size. Cut size. Yeah. Re reduce my position at that point and, you know, go from there. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what I didn't know when I was doing that, selling puts. I was, sell puts, just make money, easy printing, until it doesn't work and you have to manage through it. So what happens is, is that you have these, this, you, let's say you send, sell 10 contracts and they're 10 delta. All of a sudden they get a 60 delta. I mean, that's, that's where the size starts to balloon because now the margin requirement is the losses on there and the margin needed for that, you're, you're going to eat into your buying power. Yep. So that's the other thing too is I'm always, buying power is essentially you have your, your account and what you use. Yep. So with what I trade with selling options mostly is I have buying power and I'm usually about 50% and I'll get aggressive and get it to about 70. Right now, because of how the market is, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm 90. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so short. It's uncomfortable. Really? Yeah. It's, it's, how do you stomach that knowing that it's run up so high that it could go higher? Well, because I've had these positions on from November and if it's November. Yeah. Oh, so you, you're comfortable at this point. It's not holding on to this short. Yeah. I mean, when I sold them, there were 10 Delta, right. but again, you have to understand like that is the aspect of what can happen. Typical thesis is market's not going to melt up. Okay. Well, market melted up. 
<laughs> you were wrong. And it's, it's just a slow grind higher, higher. Would it not make sense to get out and get back in now that it's at all-time highs? With the positions that I have now? Yeah. And, and, and also, you can have a high probability, but okay. there's a high probability of also touching. So let's say you have something that's it's true. That's something that's um, a 10 delta. Okay. So that's a 90% chance that it expires worthless. Right. Or out of the money. But it's also a 20% chance that it will touch. So, so it's it, like, oh. So you, you have to be. T- it's tasty. Well, you, if you understand those guidelines, then you know that there's possibilities that this, that pays. They, that this can happen. Right. That it can touch, meaning that it's going to go against you and you have to ride that drawdown. Sure. So in this situation, I know the numbers. So being that I'm managing it and understanding the risk before getting involved, I mean, it's not where I want to be. That's, no. that's for sure no. on, on these positions here. So I know you've had situations like this before where as soon as you get out of this position, it's going to fucking tank. Well, yeah, that's the aspect. I mean, you just have to ride through it. Got to ride through it. Yeah, you just have to ride through it. I mean, if this was a, um, if this was like Nvidia, I wouldn't. Again, that's not what I'm doing here. I'm on the S and P 500, which is a big index. Right. There's 500 stocks that control it. Right. I'm not talking about one stock. No. I want, and and that's what I hate. I don't like selling options on individual names. Typically, I I will on riskier. Uh, no, not on riskier. I mean, like McDonald's, I'll sell puts. Okay. Coca Cola. Okay. And you can sell calls as well because. Sure. It's not going to get taken over, but like Nvidia, I wouldn't sell calls against. Maybe puts, um, and that's an understanding of like how under, like what each product is different and how to approach it. Got so it. a lot of a lot of times people like to use the same strategy over and over again. I'm going to sell puts and calls. No, not going to do that. Like I wouldn't want certain strategy or certain stocks to have that risk on. Yeah. I've ha- I've had biotech stocks that I've done stuff with. Complete nightmare of like waking up the next day with some surprise news. And you know having having problems with it, so they move, man. Those biotechs can move. Yeah. So that for that. Oh, we it, just discovered a new cancer drug. Oh wait, just kidding. It actually doesn't work. Yeah. So if I have a thesis on that, and I'll structure a position that's long right. out of the time w- w- further down the road. Out of the money. Yeah. yeah. I won't buy the stock or anything like that. I won't sell puts either or calls. Right. I'll structure a spread or some kind of uh, structured trade on that to to play that. It's interesting position. Do you? You keep mentioning strategy. You've said a couple times that you use different strategies. Mm-hmm. You see, because you're on social media, all this ICT strategy, smart money concept strategy. As being somebody that was on Wall Street, what are your thoughts on smart money trading as a retail person? Is that a thing? Well, there's people that have knowledge. Sure. There's people that have inside information. And in inside information, it just the other or on Friday of the Wall Street Journal, somebody was listening to their wife, not on purpose, but overhearing uh, different information that his wife was talking to uh, about their business and was trading off of that. That's insider trading. It is, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's like a birdie told me. Right. Uh, it's, this is the gray area where I feel like all the deals and the, we're in the sauna and you see me texting somebody something and it's important and you make trades off of that. Well, I didn't tell you, but you did hear from a little birdie in the sauna. Right. Yeah. That, that's how they disguise it. Yeah. The, the gap of information is as less it's ever been, yeah. but there's still people with information. And when I say information, it's not like bad information. It's that you do research. Sure. They, sometimes people get ahead of pr- press releases because they scan websites and oftentimes a company will publish something and have it saved sure. or not publish it publicly. Mm. Um, so time it properly. They control the timing of the release. Yeah. So they'll have it published, but it won't be visible, it won't hit the fr- right, it won't but hit. something will, that something will scan the site yeah. and people will pick it up, pick it up. But you, you know what I'm saying about like these guys that have like specific strategies that they say, this is the market, it's being manipulated, that's why this strategy works. Like Congress? Yeah. 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 But because my thought has always been, and tell me if I'm wrong, there's an unlimited, because markets are so um, unique in mm-hmm. the fact that no one, in my opinion, again, opinion, I don't know, I didn't work on Wall Street, I, didn't, I only worked at T3 for a year. My opinion is the, only the market. That's good, though. I mean, like, don't, don't undersell that. Right. No, that's I experience. That's, I know. But I'm just saying, like, I don't think anyone knows where the market is going. I don't think Goldman or BlackRock know other than the idea that money's going to flow into the market. I don't think it's manipulated like some of these guys say it is, especially like certain guys are like gold is manipulated and that's why it doesn't leave 2000 and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that. I think the market always knows what's best. You have an agreement between buyers and sellers at this price. That's why it's priced where it is. Well, don't tell gold bugs that. No. No. <laughs> well, yeah. You mean no, I, I don't tell Peter Schiff. Yeah, don't tell. I there are certain stocks that you can see manipulation. Positioning. Yeah. 
like with option activity, it's one of the things I follow. It's one, I, I call them Mark Cuban trades where you see these, this activity and you can see where uh, firms are taking positions. Yeah. I mean, Buffett is a notorious user of options. He doesn't talk about it, but if you look at his positions, huge. They, he takes a lot of positions huge. and he also trades in his little secret account as well. I've heard about this. <laughs> Which I'm surprised it didn't get as big news that it should have. Yeah. Uh, but the guy that says trading's no good is trading He's in his own account. And yeah. doing his own little yeah, doing his own stuff. little thing. Warren is the true degen that doesn't want to embrace it. Exactly. He because what's the game? Invest in he ETFs and shut up. Invest in his fund. And shut up. Because I can do it better. Right. I mean, that's the game. Right. That's why he's going to tell you that. He just presents himself as a cute old man. Right. And he ain't. Well, he's nice about it. He's not sure. in your face. Sure. I mean, and he, he is right to a point. Like, invest with me. I'm better than you. I mean, like, it's not like he's kind of like an MJ of investing. Yeah. He has a different edge than most people. He's not in your face about it. Like, I'm better than you. Right. But again, the game is for him. He wants your money. He right. controls and manages money right. and invests it. Right. That's the game. So do you think the market is manipulated? Well, it certainly is on an aspect of when you look at order flow and you can mani ma manipulate using op order flow for a short term. Short term, there can be manipulation. Over long term, things revert back. Um, you could see in different positioning, I was saying about unusual option activity where people are positioning for some kind of news ahead. There, are, there is information. Again, is Congress, like I think Congress should trade. I don't, I'm not one that says they have an edge. Really? Really, yeah. Oh, dude, no way. Yeah. How do you think they should, why do you think I they should I understand the conflict of interest. Yeah. But I think Congress people should trade because they are more engaged with the marketplace and they understand it at a more sophisticated but level. But they get closed door hearings where they hear what Google's doing and the government contract. It's all public though. Is it? Yes, it is public. You people just, just don't do pay research. attention. It's just easy to have outrage that Nancy Pelosi bought NVIDIA when anyone could have looked at the chart and said NVIDIA. It's true. Or Amazon. I mean, the market is, the market is going up. First of all, so you have the natural bias of this, of, of that. Now, Nancy Pelosi does have a husband that is very sophisticated in the investing market, and that's why she probably has the success of using options the way she does. Okay. But is there, when COVID happened, they had a hearing. I knew about COVID in January. I was talking about it, and I was worried, worried as hell about it. I'm like, something's going on here, but no one cared. And that's the thing in the marketplace. No one cares until... Everyone does. Everyone does. Yep. <laughs> so it didn't happen until... So you were already thinking then in January, Zoom, work from home I stuff. recommended Zoom. I remember. I saw the Yeah, it was a, a, one of my... It was your one to watch. Yeah, it, well, I... I yeah, 2019, because I was I'm like, oh, it's going to become the Google. It kind of did for a hot second. Yeah, but I, I sold it uh, in May because I thought it went, got too far, and it still continued it still to go. Went, yeah, yeah, into the summer. And that's the other thing, too, when we talk about, you know, like NVIDIA or whatnot, like... Zoom, I remember when it went from 100 to 500, and then it went Peloton, the same thing. That's another one that went. Like, these stocks eventually come back to reality. So, I mean, the manipulation, it's, it's very, like, you know, like, it's a very triggering. It for is. A lot of, but it is. when you have so much concentration of uh, capital into one name or a couple names, that is essentially manipulation because you're forcing a price, and you're just forcing money into it to push it higher. Interesting. So it doesn't I, always have to be doom and gloom on the manipulation man, part. Right. That's a really good point because manipulation comes with the connotation that it's going to be And nobody cares you. about manipulation if prices are going higher. They only care if it goes lower. I think they also only care if it's Nancy Pelosi and you weren't in it. You're not in NVIDIA. She's making money on NVIDIA, so naturally you're going to pick at her. Yeah, I think it's easy for a lot of people to get upset about Nancy Pelosi that are not engaged in the marketplace because they think they have an edge. Right. I mean, I understand that aspect of like this information, but okay, you don't... You can know earnings. You could have known earnings of NVIDIA were going to be higher. And you could have had that information. Sure, if you bought calls, you, you made money off yeah. of it. But it, it's never often about the reaction of what the earnings are. It's always about like the after the call. Or you can have a reaction of something that happens where it sells off. So you could sure. have the numbers. You can have this information that you think is going to be. I see it all the time with order flow and options. Like people are buying calls ahead of earnings. It's a surefire way of losing money. Like, I don't understand why anyone, I, that's the first trade I've ever put on, and I learned it quickly. Yeah. I lost my whole account off of it. There's no edge in trading earnings. People will push earnings and say that's engagement. It, 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 making money is what is the goal is, not engagement. I mean, like, yes, I want you to be engaged, yeah. or engagement is fun, but also to make money, not sure. engage just to,
play around. I mean, you're better off going to Vegas. So it's almost like, yeah, exactly. I was going to say that. It's like, if you're going to trade earnings, you're, you're gambling. Yeah, and to, to sum that up, the reason why is because the price is already baked into the options. Does so that have to do with the stop? Uh, the stocks are always forward-looking. They already knew that earnings would do this. Well, the option market prices it in. So there's an expected knows. range. Yeah. So, so even like on the S the SPY this week, there's yeah. an expected range that's already priced in. Last week, there was an expected range. We exceeded that. And that's the other thing too. That's why it's such an interesting marketplace where we're exceeding moves that have been priced into the options market. And again, if you're selling options, if you're a seller of those options, you're getting run over. Steamrolled. Steamrolled. That's why it's not always advantageous to be a seller all the time. You sure. Have you have to be able to buy and sell. Right. Interesting. So as we, I think we've gone like almost two hours. This is good. This is one of my longer episodes. Oh, cool. Um, I have just so many questions. And you're Keep very, going. You're very knowledgeable. Um, but I do want to pin it because I think we will need to do a part two when we hear some follow-up to this. You don't, again, you speak from a very um, knowledgeable and I would call it sophisticated background. You have a lot of experience. You've talked to a lot of people. You know a lot of the big traders. You know how these things operate. Well, I, I love this. I love, I mean, this is my life. I've done 20 years oh, of this. Oh, you can tell. Yeah. I mean, I, what I wanted to do was to get into the, the marketplace. At 15 rich. or 16, right. Well, to get rich. Right. Um, so, I mean, while I, it may seem like I'm, it's understanding the players. I mean, these are our opponents at yeah. the end of the day. So, I mean, I respect them, mm -hmm. respect the hell. I mean, they're the smartest people in the world. To think that you're going to beat them is a whole different can of worms. It's true. I mean, you're crazy. But there are opportunities for small investors, you and I, to take advantage of because the amount of capital that's needed, when they take on capital, they have to make a certain amount of money. Mm. So if I open my shop, I have a nut to cover. Right. And if there's a strategy that doesn't make me money, to cover that nut, I'm not going to do it. So that's where there's a lot of opportunities okay, that are available for investors to be able to take advantage of. So many people want to do like, oh, what's this hedge fund doing? What's that? No, that's not what you want to do. That hedge fund has different pods. And you don't know, you can look at their reports, but you don't know if this pod is actually the one that's good at picking the could right stocks. Right. It could be losing. <laughs> right. Or you don't know their positions that they have. They could be, they only have to disclose their equity positions. They don't have to disclose their option positions. Really? Yeah. So you could, they could be short. That's, that's where I do get a little shit. That's a little shady. Why you got to disclose your equity positions and not your options positions? I, I'm not quite sure on that one. Well, I, I would, the reason why I would say that is because when you have a lot of capital, they're, they're fighting each other at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. So if they know position wise, what you have going on, they're going to try to attack that. So yeah. they're, I mean, while again, this is the game that they have to play. Sure. The reason why they wouldn't want to disclose that is because they don't want to have their full right. position out there right. to be vulnerable. Be vulnerable, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You remember that famous fight between Ackman and Icon on CNBC? Yeah. I listened to it again for the like first time listening in a while. It was so funny. I watched the video on YouTube. It's like the most played CNBC clip ever on YouTube. They ever ask you to go on CNBC yet? No. You no. want to go on CNBC? Yeah, I'll go on. I think you'd do well on it. I've been in the dark for some time. I mean, I've been doing this for a while, and I've been... I've been, I, I would, I've been dark, not like dark, like. No, I know what you mean. In, in the basement. No need but to be on social media. Be, be on social media. The reason why I came out is because I'm like, I hear a lot of stuff from a lot of different people. And I'm like, okay, if these people can do it, and I'm not hating the game. I'm not hating the game at all. But if they're saying this. I know what you mean. Then. They're spewing BS. I have a real experience. Let me come out here and talk. And that's why you've gained so much popularity. It's not just that viral clip. It's the consistency of the knowledge and the experience that you share in your clips. Right. It's not just one thing. Well, listen, I mean, people will bash me. I mean, when you put yourself out there, you got to be oh, ready yeah. to get bashed. Oh, yeah. I mean, people are going to come back and say, well, your experience, you never worked at a Goldman Sachs. You never worked at, you know, a reputable firm. Neither did that guy write in that comment, probably. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, I, you're, you're going to have negative things. Sure. That was the th tough thing for me at times to be able to deal with is like, okay, I didn't have that. So is my information, is my insights as good as I think? It's an insecurity. It's no different in trading. Like, am I going to make money on this and having that insecurity and being able to overcome it? But yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate you saying that about my, my demeanor. I mean, I try to, I, I do take this serious. Yeah. Um, probably a little too serious at times. I mean, I come across a little stern. Um, I, think, I think it's good though. I do agree with that. You do come off as professionals. I think it's the haircut. Having a shaved head <laughs> makes people take you seriously. Think about all the bald shaved head people. No one, like, 
Jocko Willick, Joe Rogan, yeah, like, like hard, Peter Atia, like, you know, I think of all my fitness guys and like the guys I follow, they're like in shape, take their health serious, take their whole life serious. Every minute of every day, you got to take it serious. That's what I think of when I see, and I'm the opposite. I used to have the shape that stay hard now. Yeah, exactly. Um, advice. Last question. Final question. Advice to the young Josh. What would be the thing you'd go back in time? I'm going to take you back in, in a little time machine. You're walking from the pizza shop down a couple of doors to the stockbroker's office. What would you tell him as he's walking in? Well, I would have, there's nothing different. Sometimes, sometimes I think to myself, it would have been better to stay and working at a firm because the progression is the average trader on Wall Street is a junior and they last about seven years. And the reason why is because they're worked to hell. Right. 100 hour work weeks. 100. And when I, my story about my little check, yeah. that's the life. You work your ass off yeah. to try to get a bonus. Yeah. And then you have a down year or another pod or somebody messes up and you don't get bonus. No. You're out the door then. You're out that. the door. And it's very, it's very challenging. I mean, on Wall Street, per se, when these special situation traders and whatnot, they're trading spreads, and it's very intense. Oh, I can imagine. So that's why they're just, it's high octane, high testosterone. It ages you. Yeah, it's just, it's hard. Stressful. It's hard to do that for seven years yeah. after it. That's why. But after seven years, if you can make it, you eventually go on to other positions and you become, you, the hope is to become an MD. So you get your bonus all the time. Right. So sometimes I think to myself, it would have been better to stay on that side of it. Um, I like what I do now. I like where I'm at and telling Josh at that age, what I would have loved was have the access to information, technology, and the things that I have now. That now. Yeah. Uh, Cause the first part of that question was what would I tell a young person starting out? And it was a little bit of what we talked earlier, open an account, start with one contract. It's not about making money and it's not about losing money. It's just about understanding the game and getting involved and doing it because that's going to, that's going to be what works. I get questions like what book should I read? I'm like, I mean, you could read books, but it ain't going to, I remember as a kid, I wanted to get better at shooting a basketball. I read a ton of books on shooting basketballs. Eventually I understood like my elbow needed to be in. I got to slap my wrist, all the, all the stuff in there, studied it. I went out there, shot my shot, did not go the way that I, you still have to go out there and put in the reps and still do it. And that's why, I, you know, another controversial thing. I'm against paper trading. It drives me up the wall. I'm like, my paper trading. Like, okay. Like, paper trading is good to get used to the, to the um, platform, mm -hmm. but it ain't going to do anything for you in the, in the long run. The best way is to have skin in the game. Start with one contract. Get going. One stock. One pair. It doesn't just start. It's not about trying to make money right away. It's about learning how to get engaged. And that was the thing that I wish I would have started a lot earlier was getting more engaged with trading early on. I thought being a broker was where I wanted to be, but eventually after being a broker, I got to be on a trade desk. That was my trading experience. And that's where I started to learn a lot more and like that a lot more. Sure. Good answer. Very well-rounded. A couple of good tips in there. Anything you want to finish with? Any last minute? Because I'm, I'm sure we've kept some of the audience. You know, Yeah. people leave. But for the guys that stayed all the way through, they're committed to their trading, I would guess. Any advice you'd give to them? Keep going. Keep going. And when you get good, start, start managing. I, don't go the funded route. Just start. If you're good at, and that's the other thing too, like when you're asking about like being an indiv individual, mm -hmm. it's going to sound really bad. But you want to be so good that people start asking you to manage their money. Right. And that's a great option to have. Yeah. Because when you have other investors, and there's no one that's been successful by themselves. It's a big responsibility. And I'm not saying you should do it, but I think a lot more people that focus on us, I'm not talking to the retirees or sure. you know, that, but people that want to do this and get bigger and have bigger accounts. I really, you want to be so good that people are asking, how do I give you money? How do I give you money? And that, that's a good place to be. Do you take it? You can. You got to get licensed. You know, under 25 million, you can manage really? uh, for accredited. Yep. Good to know. Good to know, yeah. Or you can do separately managed accounts as well. So someone opens up an account. This mm. is how I started when I left yeah. uh, Wall Street. Is I wanted, I thought I could do it better. Managing as other, we all do. That's why we're here. Managing other people's accounts. But I learned two things. You got to lock up money, and right, they can't pull it a month into it. 
yeah, we can't pull it. Yeah, well, I thought I could do it better. This was in the financial crisis. And um, I was doing single managed accounts. So I was selling on the aspect of like, you could see everything I'm doing. And a separately managed account is where you individually are managing their account versus a portfolio. Sure. And um, yeah, in a financial crisis, when people are scared and they're seeing your positions, they're calling you, uh, how, how come you made this trade? How come you made that trade? Why that would drive me nuts. That's why I've never done it. Yeah, that's, that's the other aspect of it too. So there's learning curves of it. Um, so I'm not suggesting to, to manage- It's not for to, everybody. To manage people's money. Managing your own money is very challenging, and you, but you want to be so good that you have that consistency and that where people are like, wow, you, would you manage mine? Right. You really typically don't because they don't really have enough. Right. But when you get around very successful people- 100,000, 500,000, when they want to give you six figures. Right. It's not really worth it to take 10 And if grand. you have a good, a good approach- Sure. I mean, Karen the super trader is a, a lady. I mean, she got- uh, dinged by the SEC and what she was doing was, I guess, not recording. She, she returned all, she returned money all to investors with profits, but how she was getting the, noting the positions when she was rolling. She did it wrong. She, yeah, she was doing them wrong. She See, that's what I would do, bro. I'd make money and I would do some paperwork wrong and get dinged yeah. for that. Well, that's the, the complexity of the financial or the, that's why you need to lock up money and charge a management fee because you need to pay people on your staff to take care of that shit. Yeah. That's why it's so expensive on wall street. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Um, because of the regulations right. and um, risk team, right? Legal compliance, team. right? Yeah, it's <laughs> so a lot. It, it is a lot. But and being on your own is nice. Saying what you want on social media is nice. Not having to worry about your making your investors happy is nice. Right, right, right. But to me, honestly, the best. I, I love the market. I trade the market. Um, my play is I wouldn't want to manage anyone's money uh, in the marketplace just because it's. I feel comfortable doing, doing it myself, but. That's where real estate's at. Yeah, real estate is a good yeah. way to take money from the marketplace and plug it into something to to ca cash flow. Because you want a bankroll. You got to make sure you, something could happen. You ask any trader. That's one thing I took on the floor. You got to be prepared if something happens. Sure. You know, like one, you got to be able to come back tomorrow. But two, if something were to happen, you got to have something cooking. That, cooking. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be. Well, you, you tell your wife you don't make it back, you get hit by a bus, and like, oh, you don't have to close these positions out. Right. <laughs> it's true. I love it. Josh. I appreciate it. This has it's been, been awesome. Fun. Yeah, this has been good. I think we definitely need to do another one. Yeah. Whether we link up in New York or we do it again here in Miami, this has been great. Or got Chicago. Got a lot to share. Or Chicago. I'll, I have a couple of people, actually, depending on when you go back to Chicago, that I got to sit down with, so maybe we will do that. Yeah. Just not on the west side, right? East side. East side, sorry. East side. Stay away from <laughs> no, east side. I'm just kidding. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just messing. How about we stay away from the inner city in general? We'll go outside the city a little bit. You have a, you lived downtown when you were in yeah. Chicago, right? That's so, where we're moving so back you, again. You're in the mix. You like yeah. being in the mix. You're so if we get down there, yeah. be able to get on the, the floor and see them, or the sea ball. Dude, that would be sick. Yeah, it's not as... No, 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 it's not. not. But they have their little mimic open outcry. Of course. Yeah. Love it. All right, listen, everybody. Thank you so much for staying all the way through. If you listened, if you watched, no matter where you're at, make sure you drop a comment. Let us know what you think. Let me know what you want me to ask Josh next time we have him on. We appreciate you. We love you. Make sure you're subscribed. We'll see you in the next episode.